Time for the final choice in my before hiatus weaver poll that I held about a year ago. Yeah, I probably should have gotten to this sooner, but hey, this game also had a long development cycle, so it's only fitting. So let's then venture forwards to the harsh radiation filled fields of STALKER, Shadow of Chernobyl. What? The title has periods. Don't put them there if you don't want people to pronounce it like that. Released in 2007, this kind of sort of open world first person shooter is said to take its inspiration from 1972 novella Roadside Picnic by Arkadian Boris Trukatsky and by proxy its 1979 Andrei Tarkovsky directed film adaptation Stalker. But there's some misconception of the game being a license to work. I have seen the movie and basically what the game borrows from it is the atmosphere and one plot device and that's it. Ah, so that's why the dots in the title, to make it legally distinct. For the creatives, and forgive me for looking them from notes, are the project leader Anton Bolsakov, who did the same for Cossacks franchise and the team's previous game Codename Outbreak, and then there are the lead designers, Andrew Prokhorov and uh, Yuri Negrobov, who have since then been involved with the Metro franchise. So let's then meet our main character who has AMNESIA! Yeah, that tired old trope that was everywhere at the time. Well, at least it's better implemented in here than in The Witcher. It is the futuristic past year of 2012 in the northern reaches of Ukraine. When the no memory dude who will be from now on referenced as Mark 1 gets in a vehicle accident but is soon safe to the care of a local American slash job provider. The only hints to his past are the visible SDA, just kidding, just kidding, the visible stalker tattoo and a reminder in his PDA to kill someone called Strelok. Oh, I'm sorry, THE Strelok. Thus he ventures to solve the mystery of his past to the surrounding area of the infamous Chernobyl power plant, now named as the Zone, that has become even rougher thanks to the second explosion six years earlier. That one brought all kinds of unnatural phenomena with it like unexplained gravitational and elemental ruptures in reality and grossly mutated fauna and people, some of them being able to use psychic abilities. Not to mention these phenomena create ability enhancing artifacts that all sorts of interest groups want their hands on, including various low lives, mercenaries and military. What are you standing there for, stalker? If you want to go through, come up and we'll have a chat. If not, I suggest you take off before we get angry. Yeah, you're going to hear this and similarly quaintly clumsy over the topness multiple times. In multiple languages. There are a few English spoken lines here and there by such talents as Yuri Loventhal, Robin Atkin Dawes and Neil Kaplan, just to name all Prince of Persia alumni, but all side character banter is untranslated from Ukrainian and Russian. Seems like the majority of the fanbase appreciate this for the added immersion, but uh, am I the only one who finds this distracting? Sure, they don't say any plot crucial and stuff, but uh, they have several uh, lore building uh, lines, so I'm not sure why the developers just didn't pick one language and stick with it. Not that it matters that much because uh, the voice acting in both is being silly, especially with death yells. You, you died 10 seconds ago, shut up! So the plot is pretty much a wild goose chase for Strelok for most of its runtime and it tends to get structurally repetitive. I mean, you have to dig up two super secretive laboratories in a row for documents detailing shady pseudoscience experiments, not to mention all characters who give Mark 1 these assignments are barely distinct from one another. Yet in this game's case, loosely constructed story helps to serve its atmosphere. Its world is uniquely uninviting and hastily melancholic, so the atmosphere works best when the player is all by themselves, having only a vague idea where to go to escape this hellhole where everyone tries to survive in their desperate search for riches or just any sort of purpose. Granted, the story doesn't go into Stalker the movie style, introspective, uh, high gear, philosophical ponderings, but I can still wipe with the mood it's setting. 
The everyone trying to survive part wasn't exaggeration because the game has a revolutionary AI system where every human and monster have their own daily routines and visit other levels. But from my frog perspective I was unable to tell how well it works in practice. Or maybe that's because I focus too much on the main story and not any side missions that the game has a plenty. All missions are listed on Mark 1's personal digital assistant. That ironically was trying to become obsolete technology when this game was released. That also keeps tracks of such things as encyclopedia entries detailing the game's lore and ranking system to determine who is the toughest dude in the neighborhood. How these points are counted though, I have no idea. The side objectives, at least the ones I took a look at, had their share of problems that went beyond repetition. First, there are unsolicited missions that have a day-long time limit, which wouldn't be that bad, but I felt obligated to do them because I didn't know how much reputational loss a failed mission would give, and after completing them you have to walk long distances in order to collect your reward. Sometimes they simply bug out, like the one where I had to get back this guy's family rifle, but never found it. I'm right at the spot on the map, where is it? Partially that can be explained with Shadow of Chernobyl originally going to be a wider sandbox experience, but because this was at a time when that concept wasn't properly coined yet, the publisher people were all like, what is this bloated junk? Players are going to be confused with choice paralysis, make it more linear, please! The game's files are indeed filled with unused maps, monsters, uh, factions and mechanics which include uh, driving with vehicles. And because uh, this all had to be crossed in before release, it has left some oddities that just can't be hand waved with that life in the zone, I guess. Enemy AI also had to be lobotomized to not make things too soul-crushingly difficult. And it shows as several quirks like trying to shoot through solid walls, which they sometimes succeeded at. Even in this state, the combat is fairly enjoyable. Pistols, picket machinery, grenades, and sometimes even your knife are used to provide intense confrontations where life is cheap with further tactility added by weapon wearing system. So be sure to have them in top notch shape or otherwise your weapons may jam at the critical moment. The difficulty isn't overwhelming, but the further it goes, the tougher it gets, and I strongly advise to do several optional missions from local money men as well for resource gathering. Otherwise you end up like me and have to stop at the beginning of the last level due to the enemy's armor piercing bullet ripping you to shreds. This playthrough at that was by the way done at stalker or medium difficulty, a fact that probably made several hardcore stalker connoisseurs recoil in disgust. When I first tried this game about two years ago, I was advised by a schoolmate of mine who is very into the community, familiar with cheeky, breaky, suga, blue, all that stuff, to play it on hard or veteran difficulty. This is because of a bug that uh, makes all enemies bullet sponsors on easier difficulties, but on harder difficulties, uh, while they can one shot you, you can do the same to them. Well, I had grown skeptical towards this claim by the time of this review, and turns out it's just an urban legend! What even more, I found out from the manual that the harder difficulties also decreases the amount of helpful items. Yeah, therefore playing it on uh, veteran or master difficulty is more of a proper etiquette. And I'm sorry stalkerites, but I clearly look something different from my gaming experiences. I can understand this culture though, proving that you can uh, stand up against overwhelming obstacles in uh, harsh brutal environments uh, no matter who or what is trying to put you down. So Stalker, Shadow of Chernobyl, let's say I have respect for it. The game radiates classic Eurochunk aesthetic and I suppose some find it charming, but for those who have preference towards good craftsmanship, its coding inconsistencies can be entertainment factor hindering instead. And they can be that even to the former when they break quests. Also, the story isn't particularly deep, even if the world building is rather stellar. However, the game's atmosphere, potentially adrenaline inducing combat, and its complexity in resource managing do save a lot. And it's understandable why the zone resonates with players who want more challenge. 
For me, roaming through Slavic Fallout was often frustrating, but I can say I wasn't enthralled by Trustic Harmony. In the following two years, the original got two side games, independent expansions, I'm not sure what to call them, Clear Sky and Call of Pripyat being a prequel and sequel respectively, and uh, next year it should be have a numbered sequel, Heart of Chernobyl. Whenever I'm going to play them or not, hmm, tough to say. I mean, uh, maybe if they have more character-focused uh, narratives, I mean, I like the mood, but I've heard Clear Sky has some infuriating mechanics, and uh, more of this game's gameplay loop, well, I mean, uh, I'm not sure how much more I would enjoy it, considering I didn't even finish the game. But hey, at least by the time of stopping, I was ranked as the highest uh, ranking stalker in the entire zone, and that's what is important, right? I mean, I beat the second guy by whole 200 points!